You're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We're coming to you from the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations around Vancouver, B.C. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and this is the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. Welcome to Rethreading Madness. When I've never been further, knowing what the hell I'm gonna do. You're listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Heather Tunold who is a wonderful person who I saw a brief 15 minute video of and thought I have to have this person on my show. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Really, truly. It's my pleasure. Can you tell folks a little bit about who you are? Yeah. Um, I'm a person with lived experience of substance use. Um, I spent 10 years using illicit substances and I'm now a parent and undergrad student, and I'm also a frontline worker. Um, most of my time using substances was in the downtown east side. That was a place that I considered my home, and I now work in the downtown east side. Um, that that is a, a wonderful summation. And if I was somebody other than myself, I, other than the dealing with the drug use, I I would want to have this bio. So. So today I want to talk about structural violence. Your video was on structural violence and I, I found it compelling. And I want to start with, you know, kind of talking about what that is, because I don't believe a lot of people know what it is. And so to do that, I want to start with naming our privilege and my understanding of privilege, because I know this is also something that people don't get. They feel like they've had a rough life and so therefore they don't have any privilege. But the truth is, is that the way you have privilege is sometimes very much invisible. Um, right. So to me, privilege is sort of unearned access or advantages. So you are white, rich, male is best, able-bodied, straight, not too young, not too old. And you hold some higher education, post-secondary is best. Um, so you have some version of that somewhere on the spectrum, you have one or all of those things and one or all of those things is privilege. Is that your understanding as well? That's my understanding. Yes. Um, to, to kind of, um, elaborate on what you were saying as a person who is white, I, it doesn't matter what I experienced in my life. I have, I want to share that I've experienced everything from, um, poverty, adverse childhood experiences, um, all kinds of different forms of abuse um, and street entrenchments, homelessness, all the things, but I still recognize that I live with white privilege. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples that I like to bring up is that growing up in a white family, I didn't get my needs met. And um, I experienced neglect and various forms of abuse and also going hand in hand with living in poverty. But the Ministry of Children and Family Development did not intervene in my well-being because my family is white. Meanwhile, my peers who were black and indigenous and people of color, um, they were often ripped from their loving homes. Right. And and I think that's a good example of white privilege and also navigating the system as a youth who used drugs, I did experience some level of um, of of difficulties for sure, but it was far different than my um, counterparts who were Black and Indigenous. Right. So. My favorite story around privilege is um, is speeding my car. Right. I I I love to speed, <laughs> and um, I got caught by a cop pulled over. And um, she gave me a ticket and mm -hmm. left. And I had had three speeding tickets that year and decided that I really might, my, my life couldn't afford a third one that year in terms of my insurance. And so I yeah. decided I had to fight it. Yeah. So I asked her for all her notes and, and the ticket itself. And when it came, the ticket she gave me was clear of any ethnicity. But right. when I got her copy of the ticket, it wrote native on it. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah. 
And and so I went to court and I fought this and I brought my DNA results, which clearly indicate that I'm very white. Mm. And um, but her whole attitude towards me was, um, you know, even in talking to her before going into court, it was, you know, it was really condescending and it was really mm. insistent that I have to plead guilty and that I don't have any other choice and blah, 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 blah. But I, I won. I, the ticket was thrown out. It wasn't thrown out because she'd written native on there. It was thrown out because she really didn't have the criteria to give me a speeding ticket. It just didn't, she didn't have enough evidence. I saw in that, that um, I went and, and confronted this ticket because I am white and I've been raised white and I've been raised to think that I can fight something. And even if I'm guilty, I can get off. Yeah. You know, and even even when somebody says I'm native, I can still fight that. And I can say, no, your your behavior towards me is inappropriate. Right. Right. So it's it was it really taught me a lot about uh, structural racism and the insidiousness of racism and how it's invisible and how everybody kind of goes along with it, not really understanding that they're going along with it because it's so normalized. Yeah. Um, but your conversation was on structural violence. So I am hoping that you can give us some understanding of what structural violence is. Yeah, I want to touch quickly on the privilege part. I want to finish <clears throat> um, my thought here. So I, um, so with what you're experiencing, it made me think about how us white people need to be mindful of our own biases and our privileges. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and we need to do more than just acknowledging them. And, um, you know, I consider my partner who's Denny and Cree and his experience is much different than my experience anytime he enters any kind of store or whatever. So that's that. But yeah, let's get into structural violence. Yeah. Okay. So so tell us what is structural violence? Um, OK, so structural violence is when social structures or organizations fail to allow people to meet their needs. And structural violence often results in excess death in communities or and or um, poor quality of life and deaths that happened as a result of structural violence um, these wouldn't happen with greater equity and resources in communities and I also argue that structural violence is one of the most deadly kinds of violence and um, it's interesting though because it's less obvious to society as a whole. Okay, so let's start with how it's obvious. Let's give me some examples of how it's obvious. Um, It's less obvious is what I would say. Oh, it's less obvious. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's more deadly because it's less obvious in the same way that racism can be very, sorry? Yeah, no, yeah, that's what I was saying is that it's less obvious. And in it, it's kind of, it, it can go hand in hand with, with the conversation of privilege because um, there's this quote that I often I like to share. I'm trying to remember it. It's it's um, just because something is not an issue to you personally doesn't mean that it's not an issue. Yes. Right? Exactly. So it, this happens a lot with white people and they will deny a black or indigenous person's experience because they've never experienced it. And we we can put that into the conversation of structural violence, right? Because the deaths and the harms that are happening as a result of structural violence um, if you're not experiencing it or witnessing it firsthand, then as far as you're concerned, it doesn't exist. And the people um, who need to hear these conversations, and I've mentioned this in my in my talk at the conference, was they don't they don't believe that they need to have these conversations because it doesn't affect them because they're not emotionally invested. So therefore, these things don't exist to them, and it, it actually doesn't matter. Right. So that's what I'm saying by less obvious. So how does um, structural violence um, create a poor quality of life? I mean, um, I can imagine it, but but please <laughs> tell me. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, well, we I, well, what I like to say is that what I like to think about in the context of structural violence is how poverty, racism. Um, and all of the different kinds of isms intersect with each other. And um, I'm going to think of an example, like people who use drugs exist amongst all different socioeconomic statuses. It's not exclusive to poor people. However, the people who live in poverty and who live unsheltered are the ones who experience the worst type of structural violence. And so um, the poor quality of life comes into play by the policies and the practices that we're seeing within 
all places in Canada when it comes to people who use drugs. And that also that includes the downtown east side. And it's going back to this idea that people are not getting their needs met. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a person who um, who who's the expert of their own life. They want to get the support that they believe they deserve. Right. And and they're not able to reach those goals because of the systems that are in place. And And some of those systems in place, I'm imagining, is that when they say this is what I need, somebody in a position of power reinterpret that to say, no, that's not what you need. You need this over here, or yes. you, you don't need that much. You only need this much. And right. so, so what's happening is that the people who are poor or users or unsheltered go farther and farther down the, you know, the system and get less and less and less and get, am I making, is that make, yeah. am I getting this right? No, that totally makes sense. It, it, and it and <clears throat> um it goes hand in hand with how drug war propaganda impacts how we interact with people who use drugs, right? Um we ha- we society um operates under this premise that there is a deserving poor and an undeserving poor, right? And that actually goes um it's rooted in like hundreds of like Elizabeth and poor laws from hundreds of years ago mm-hmm. and these policies and practices still exist today it's like okay so this poor person who lives on house they don't use drugs so they're just de- therefore they're deserving of housing right mm-hmm. but that poor person over there who uses substances they're not deserving of housing because um they are considered morally deficient right and they're and there are, and in the eyes of society, they're not um, capable of participating in society and capitalism and all things, right? So it kind of goes hand in hand with that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like colonialism. Yeah, no, it is. It, all of it is connected. Like one yeah. thing can't exist without the other. Right. So, um, so when it comes to people who use drugs, um, they're often, as I mentioned in my talk, infantilized, policed, and surveilled. And for example, I, I'm trying to like not breach any confidentiality here, but I have many clients who who have been denied of what they need in terms of housing, treatment, um, and overall goals because of um, practices within our healthcare systems that are based on drug war ideology right and it's very oppressive and you know um i'm trying to think of a a good example i mean even with people who who want safe supply right right what we're seeing right now with um with the benzo dope and the fentanyl poisoning epidemic um say a person uses between a gram or a half gram and a gram of fentanyl per day that's a lot of fentanyl and when they're offered between 30 to 50 milligrams of methadone to start to to ease their withdrawal symptoms that's not going to work so what's going to happen they're going to be denied of what they need over and over and over again and they're going to become sick and tired of accessing healthcare system, healthcare services right do you know what is stopping people from giving them an appropriate amount of methadone it's not even the methadone i think what at this point we need to be giving um a full uh, range of different forms of safe supply and so what would be stopping them from doing that or pres- i guess stopping prescribers from doing that would be the prescriber policies right and that boils down to the college of physician guidelines and there's not enough action taken to change these guidelines um in and so what i always suggest is that guidelines need to change in consultation with people who use drugs mm-hmm. and not only do the, that need does that need to happen but the it's on the government as well right like it's not the only option should not be prescribed safe supply it should be um uh, the the drug user groups like Dolph and CPPW and Van Du should be granted funding to be able to operate compassion clubs 
to address these needs, right? And so the inaction of the government and the inaction of College of Physician, um, the the leaders in charge of that, like that is structural violence. So what is their current policy, say the College of Physicians and Surgeons, what is their current policy on providing safe supply or? Well, the whole, the entire safe, the I'm going to say this in quotes, safe supply, what they consider a safe supply is not actually safe supply. So people as of now are able to get up to 112 milligrams of hydromorphone. And it, what is that? And Sorry. that that is um it's a opioid and okay. it's, it's a it's a much um weaker than fentanyl. So it's not actually going to be enough when a person gets that much. It doesn't actually cut it, right? So the College of Physicians have deemed this hydromorphone as a safe supply um but it's not so anyways so their version of a safe supply is actually from what i'm hearing is getting phased out so Mm. that's not even going to be accessible at some point right they only implemented that because of the pandemic and um so so right now that's what the policy is uh, up to 112 milligrams of hydromorphone sometimes people can get fentanyl patches but even that requires um, patients to abide by really strict rules like they have to come into the clinic every other day and they have to get approved for what do you call it um oh my god I can't think of the the name they have to be basically approved with um under pharmacare right because it's an off-label use wow, so technically okay. the the fentanyl patches are um they're probably used for pain for, cancer. For pain. yeah so you have to get special authority that's the word i was thinking of yeah. right and that takes time and so i don't even want to have i don't want to go to my pharmacy every day to get what i need like i got enough going on and you can imagine living with different barriers and being expected to go into the clinic every other day to get your fentanyl patch changed like that's not sustainable Right. So that's one of some examples of the policies today. And on top of that, the the typical opioid agonist therapy is methadone, cadian, suboxone. And it's very rare to see somebody actually end up on a therapeutic dose unless they're not using at all. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So when they removed this thing after, you know, you said it, they put it in place because of COVID and now they're removing it. What are they replacing it with? That's a really good question. I actually don't know. It doesn't sound like there's anything that that's, they're replacing it with. Well, I, that, you see, now that, that's something I don't understand. If the college recognized it as a need and they supplied the need, at least even if it was like not sufficient, yeah. how can they remove it and not look at the need that they are now? I mean, clearly they acknowledge there's a need. Well, I think that the reason why they, or I, I don't think there's one reason, but something that I've heard recently is that there's some concern about diversion and, you know, um, these hydromorphone pills being ending up across the country. Right. And, um, and I, I'm not doubting that that's happening, but I also think that there's a, um, a piece of mass hysteria that's happening there as well. And, and I, I I think in a bit of a more unorthodox way and I think, okay, that's, I, I get it. I get that prescribers have to, um, have to be a little bit more careful and you know, they have more of a liability, but I also see that there's a safe supply <laughs> circulating communities now, right? right? Like this is something that's going to kill people. And um, it sounds a lot like what they did, what happened in the United States with the ox- oxycodone um, hysteria where it was like, Oh, this is going to lead to destruction and overdose and all the things, but it's actually like the, they're it's diverting the real issue at hand. Right. Right. We just need to take a little break. Um, Heather, but we'll be right back, folks. Don't go away. Check out Think Indian every Monday at 8 to 9 p.m. Think Indian is Van City's Aboriginal pop culture show featuring special guests, sharing community events, and playing a diverse range of musical genres from hip-hop, country, rock, blues, contemporary, and traditional. 
Thinking In every Monday at 8 to 9 p.m. on Vancouver's Co-op Radio and heard online at www.coopradio.org. Howdy, folks. Tune in every Sunday afternoon from 4 to 5.30 for What the Folk, singer-songwriters, deep folk, roots music. It's all folk music. Sundays from 4 to 5.30 p.m. right here on Vancouver Co-op Radio, 100.5 FM and www.coopradio.org. You're listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and I'm talking with Heather Tunold about structural violence and drug use, the downtown east side, and the issues that go along with that, including privilege. And we were just talking about safe supply, and you were about to talk about diversion. Heather, can you talk a little bit more about that? What is diversion? Um, diversion is, is considered when a patient who is accessing safe supply or, or what you call carries where they, it's not a, like a witness dispense. And so, so let me just stop you there. My understanding of a witness dispense means that say somebody is uh, using heroin and to get off of it, they are put on methadone, but initially, this is my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong. Initially they have to go to the pharmacy every yeah every day yeah and get their supply they're given one day and it's usually in liquid form so that there's no possibility that they're not actually taking the methadone yeah. um and they have to do that every day for a period of time until they are deemed safe to get a longer period yeah. of drugs at which they dispense themselves is that yes yeah, that's correct. And I can go on about that whole issue, but it would divert us from what I'm talking about. So we can come back to that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that's essentially what witness dispense is, but it doesn't always happen with methadone. It happens with many different prescriptions and stuff like that. And so what's happening or what has happened with the so-called safe supply, um, aka hydromorphone, and um, but it also just side note, it, it it's also... Um, considered like Adderall and st- other kind of stimulants but um, so with those safe supplies they're not witness dispense they're given um, a, I have to look back it might be a week's worth or it, it's more than a day's worth right and, and it's not witnessed right so, so what the the concern amongst prescribers is is that these drugs are being diverted into different communities and sold and that is a big no-no, right? And that's what I think. Again, I want to look into this and, and get more clarification. But from what I've heard is that prescribers are concerned that that is happening. And um, therefore, they want to shut down this so-called safe supply. And they want to do that how? Oh, they want to, uh, I, 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 we have to talk to a prescriber about that. I don't know what's happening. This is just what I've been told by coworkers. Oh, okay. um, but I, I think that what's happening is conversations with prescribers and patients that this is not going to continue. And that's just wild to me. So are they going to go back to the witnessed dispensing? Um, well, I, I mean, think, what other option do they have? Yeah, I think what they're going to go back to is, is just regular opioid agonist therapy and um I'm fentanyl. sorry what is what is that opioid agonist therapy yeah. is is uh, methadone cadian suboxone stuff okay. like that and okay. now um a fentanyl patch would be considered a form of opioid agonist therapy but as i mentioned that is um there's a lot of barriers um in accessing that mm-hmm. um one of the things that um, is a reality, uh, well, I don't, how do I want to put this? Um, I want to talk about harm reduction. And I know that Vancouver has done this thing with their four pillars and they've touted it as this 
world-class harm reduction program. Um, what is harm reduction? Well, <laughs> I understand the way that I've always explained harm reduction is that as an, it is an act of resistance against harmful policies. Oh, interesting. Structural violence, right? right? And harm reduction recognizes that people are going to engage in so-called risky behaviors no matter what, right? Mm. The drug war, prohibition, all the things have not stop people from engaging in behaviors that have the potential of causing harm so harm reduction is um centered in self-determination without expectations right and when you're thinking about this in terms of substance use people who operate under a harm reduction model they don't force their beliefs on people they don't um, expect a person to quit using drugs and they also don't believe that a person sh should quit using drugs to have their basic needs met mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that they deserve safety and you know um, equipment and all the things to prevent them from poor quality of life disease and death right and um, at the same time there's so much more that harm reduction is than just providing needles and pipes and places to stay and stuff like that. Like, for example, cultural safety is harm reduction, right? People having access to culture, um, trans care is harm reduction, right? People who, um, who may live with intersectional, um, barriers in their life that, that are also transgender or, part of the LGBTQ to us plus community, having access to um, things that help support their quality of life is harm reduction, right? Supporting sex workers and staying safe is harm reduction. It's so much more than, um, than the surface level stuff that we talk about. Yeah. And as you say that, it makes me remember what you were talking about is that um, this whole notion that there's this undeserving group of people that somewhere on that hierarchy, you are undeserving. And I've been trying to say this for a long time that coming from a really, really bad childhood that left me with the belief that you know, I was somebody, it was okay to hurt. And when I say that to people, I, I get this reaction, like, what are you talking about? Like, but yeah. you are the first person that's actually said this out loud that I go, that's what it is. That's what I'm trying to talk about. This idea that, you know, and it used to be smokers. If you were somebody who smoked in the general population, you know, at work or something, you could be sort of spat on or talked down to because you had a cigarette in your hand. Um, they do it with fat people. They do it with, right. um, you know, they do it with uh, anybody who's racialized, right? And so there's this undeserving level that you hit that somehow yeah. it becomes okay in society to treat you poorly. Right. Um, yeah. So, so you're talking, so each one of these things that you're talking about cultural safety, trans care, you know, the intersectionality of things uh, that goes back to this whole notion of what do you deserve? And yeah. of course we've made some inroads in terms of cultural safety, you know, and, uh, you know, and there's places now where, you can't be racist without a whole group of people standing up and saying, hey, this isn't OK. You know, and same with trans folks. You know, it's just we are making changes. We have not right. made the same changes when it comes to somebody who uses drugs and is unsheltered. Well, yeah. And I also I want to point out that we haven't made enough changes in any of those areas. Mm -hmm. But definitely there's more absolutely happening. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I want to add that another form of harm reduction is 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 considering how society is very patriarchal and you know there's so much sexism and and patriarchy and misogyny in this world and and being able to address those things confront those issues as well is a form of harm reduction right mm -hmm. like there's so much more but yes you're right um people who use drugs aren't really um the center of these conversations yet right no no, I, I see that there are people like yourself who are trying to make it a part of the conversation. But, yeah, um, you know, I, I work around the issue of therapy abuse, which is very hard to 
get the same kind of traction, but you could, you know, all of these issues come down to therapy abuse, but the people we are trying to confront and deal with are the mental health professionals who are the very people who decide and define whether or not their clients are okay and are saying the truth. So it's this, yeah. And I see the same thing that happens for drug users, right? Like it doesn't matter what you say, if you're unhoused and poor and, um, and using, um, you lose credibility. Yeah. And then you add different intersections into those narratives, right? Like, like being a trans BIPOC person who uses drugs, like it's just, just a a whole other level of oppression within society. Right. Mm -hmm. And also like all of those things that I mentioned, they often intersect with being a person who uses drugs. Right. So you talked in the video that I saw about the drug war and how there's this disease model. Yeah. And, um, you know, and you you mentioned punish infant, infant, I can never say that word, infantilized surveillance and policed. How do those things, what do those things look like on the street? Oh, wonderful question. Okay. So infantilized, punished, surveilled and policed. So I was just talking about how a person is trying to access methadone, something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. The amount of surveillance and infantilization that happens when a person is trying to access OAT, opioid agonist therapy, is wild, right? So you think about it as that, and that's, that's a very simple example, but it goes much deeper than that. I think when I'm looking at my Craig's, like, like Craigslist for housing for myself, it's like, no drugs, no, no right. this, no that, right? And and then you know, it, it's it it really limits people's abilities to get their biological needs met of housing, right? Like right. stuff like that. And and like when you go into any kind of harm reduction building, I've worked in harm reduction in in housing, right? And the most, I say that. 80 to 90 percent of the time staff are looking at the cameras to watch and see what everybody's doing and they don't trust what a person says or they say oh this person looks no good and you know we're gonna we're gonna watch that person or or this person told me to and um now i'm they're gonna be under my like i'm gonna be watching them right and 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 an abuse of authority it's yeah it can be for sure Mm -hmm. and you see this like this way of interacting with people who use drugs within like for oh, here, here's another one um if we have meal tickets right mm-hmm. maybe we have a lot of meal tickets to give out and a person wants two and it's like no 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 you only get one okay but that person is like living minute by minute and surviving we don't know what their journey to the door looked like right. and they experiencing structural violence in their everyday life and you're saying no you only get one meal ticket like stop it right the other thing that I think of is how in treatment right like you relapse once and that's it you know I I know of many recovery communities within the lower mainland that will completely shun a person for relapsing and that's what leads people to die as well right and and we talk about how we need more treatment centers and detox facilities but a lot of those those programs are centered in 12 step recovery which i think it's great if a person does um if 12 step recovery works for those people but it's a lot of people it doesn't work with and for a lot of people it doesn't work yeah. with and and so when that's the only option it's like oh you better take what you are given and you're shit mm-hmm. out of luck right and that's really fucked up when you think about it, because there are colonial roots to the 12 step programs. And um, for example, the third tradition within the AA traditions was um, what is it? Um, The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop using. But do you know what that is rooted in? It was because black people wanted to join these AA meetings and they weren't allowed in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Right. Once they were finally allowed to participate in these meetings, they changed or they they created that third tradition to say 
oh, the only desire for membership is, or sorry, the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop using. So there, that is rooted in racism. And um, also the 12 step program, again, if it works for somebody, that's wonderful, but there's a lot of shame in, in those practices, right? Like we're told that we're defi- deficient right. and we're, we have defects of character when no, uh, I'm not defective. I, I survived a lot of really f- things and this is how I learned how to cope. Right. Right. And so there's all those things that happen and that's, it's like, okay, if you don't do your steps, you're going to be punished by um, getting kicked out of this recovery house. Right. And yeah. and Uh, We just need to take a little break, folks. We'll be right back. What the Folk, Sundays at four. A no-holds-barred, five-ring folk music circus with singer-songwriters, local musicians, cutting-edge folk heretics, be spirited away to foreign lands or immersed in ancestral sounds with our group of What the Folk hosts, Paul Norton, Jim Burnett, Jack Schuler. Paul Cordolis and Dinny Knowles. It's all folk music. It just depends where your folks are from. What the Folk on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM, and online at coopradio.org. We're all running around in our own directions Sometimes it seems we've forgotten which way to turn Sometimes it seems all we see is the light of our own reflection Caught in the flame of the bridges we have burned Thank you. 
listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Cult Radio, CFR 0100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and I'm talking with Heather Tunold about structural violence as it pertains to drugs and drug use. Um, Heather, what is the drug war? What does that currently look like? And maybe, maybe we need to say, what does it currently look like in the downtown east side? Yeah, um, I can touch a little bit even globally, but and, and we won't go too much into that, but I don't think that there is any country on the planet that doesn't operate under some level of drug war ideology. And that includes Portugal. And we can unpack that later. But um, overall, the war on drugs in Western society exists under archaic belief systems rooted in racism, patriarchy and classism. And it's under the premise that substances are inherently bad. Mm -hmm. People who use them are morally deficient members of society and governments implement policies that reflect this kind of stuff. Right. When in reality, substance use is a part of the human experience and the way that the drug war exists within, I'd say, the lower mainland and the downtown east side is it's what we're what we're seeing with Hastings and Hastings encampment. Right. Like that's a really good example. That is an extension of the drug war alongside capitalism and racism and classism. Right. Okay, so let's like, let's just let people know because we're heard all over the world we're heard all the way to japan and turkey and so when you say have um hastings encampment um maybe just maybe describe that for folks okay so since the new mayor ken sims has been in office he's he's a very right-wing conservative man and he without any consultation from community organizations he directed the police and city workers to take down tents that are, you know, when you go into the downtown east side along Hastings, there it's, it was all tents of people who use drugs mostly and not 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 exclusively, but it's a result of the the lack of housing within our communities. Right. Oh yeah, and, we have tons of lack of housing. So oh, yeah. Hastings was full for for three four blocks. Yeah, I think, and maybe even down a little bit on the side streets. It was basically a housing complex. It was tent yeah. after tent after tent all along the sidewalks. On yeah. The streets. And yeah. So when you say that that they were sort of all along capitalism, I'm assuming you're saying that the tents were next to stores and storefronts. And is that what you meant? Something like that. Yeah. So over the years, the downtown east side has been gentrified by businesses and, you know, um, condos and oh, money, know, money, 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 all, money, all money, 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 money. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think what's happening is a reflection of 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 like meeting their needs. Right. Not the people, you know, people who live in poverty. Mm -hmm. And so without any consultation with BC housing or with with housing organizations, they decided to uh, take initiative. And I say that sarcastically um, by taking down people's tents without providing adequate shelter and housing. Right. And they did more than take them down. So Didn't they, they throw things out they, like. Yeah, so that's what I was going to get at. They yeah. large garbage trucks and they didn't care if something was sentimental. They grabbed people's shit and they threw it out very aggressively. And there was some leaked documents, actually, that made the news from the mayor's office that said, um, use escalation tactics. Right. Oh my and God. this is just wild. Right. And so it's been happening for over a month now. Actually, this gives me an opportunity to talk about deficit ideology as well. And so how that plays into this is, is I believe that Ken Sims, is with his strategies, as long as we're looking down at the economic pyramid, the people in power and the economic, the economically elite members of society like Ken Sim and the VPD, they are able to avoid critical analysis, right? And um, it... It takes the attention away from the atrocities that VPD inflict on the communities, right? And in the eyes of society and people who don't give a shit about people who use drugs and poor people, um, they are going to just give them a pat on the back. And this is great, wonderful, right? Um, when in reality, it's, it's so f right? Because these the people who are who are in tents and who, who are living unsheltered and adequate housing, like, they're they're not there because they want to be there. They're there because 
this is their community and they have no access to housing. Right. Right. And the housing that they are offered is, you know, bed bugs and cockroaches and poor living conditions. And um, where the other options are overcrowded shelters and things get stolen and, you know, it's really chaotic. And so people rightfully choose not to access those things. And in, and and according to the mayor and the city of Vancouver, it's like, oh, no, they should be getting what they what they're offered. Right. And that's no. Ken Sim would not take a fucking overcrowded shelter or nor would he accept housing in a f- bed bug ridden SRO. Mm-hmm. Right. So so the very few options that didn't reflect the number of people in tents were very f- options. Right. Well, there's this idea that it's better to be there than in a tent. And, and it, people yeah, don't understand that 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 isn't that isn't really an option. Because, yeah. And even then, like, you know, it's, there's supportive housing that that is often offered and it doesn't always work for everyone. And that goes back to the um, the the idea that people who use drugs are are over policed right because mm-hmm. there's all kinds of rules within those supportive housing buildings you can't like say we think about a person who or a couple who have been together for 25 years right mm-hmm. and i've seen this a lot a couple have been together for 25 years and they get offered housing in an sro and the one partner gets offered housing elsewhere and then they get separated and then they want to have the partner over to be like um kind of like a permanent guest because why not right. and not allowed having guests right like right. It, it's like and, and this is their support system so right. i don't blame anybody for not wanting to ask to be able to live in those places right well that seems really um counter oh yeah productive to yeah. remove your you know the person that's closest to you just right. so have a house. Yeah. Um, it, um, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it's like none of these people who are implementing these rules and policies, like I, 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 I could never see them accepting such conditions. And that goes hand in hand with this ideology of this deserving poor. And, you know, you get what you're given and that's. Yeah. And that's the colonial structure, right? Colonial we structure. decide, we decide what and is love, yeah. the right way to live and the right way to be and yeah. what is right, you know, what is good and what isn't. And you're not okay until you succumb to and, yeah. and agree to what we have decided is most important. Right. Yeah. Like you can't do that to any other demographic. No. And right. Yeah. And we're back to the undeserving core, you know, that, that, that there are certain people that it's okay to treat that way. Yeah, and that goes back to the 1600s in Britain, right? Mm -hmm. It was this undeserving core and a deserving core. And so if you were capable of working and you were willing to work, then you were deserving poor. And if you weren't willing to work in conditions, then you were an undeserving poor, right? Like, yeah. And another thing that I actually, I want to touch on is um, how a lesser talked about example of drug work policy or drug war ideology is how many parents ha- have their children removed for simply using drugs, right? And and they and it's for that reason only rather than their ability to parent. And my friend Hawkfeather spoke on this in their talk at the BC Center on Substance Use Conference. And um and we see this stuff happen more commonly among Indigenous and Black communities, which shows us the drug how drug war intersects with racism and sexism and patriarchy and other isms. But I know many parents who use drugs who are amazing parents, and they've had their kids taken away for only being drug users, right? And so that's a whole other issue in and of itself, and it's very much related to um, the drug war. And okay. so another thing that the how the drug war today um, kind of presents itself within British Columbia is how our premier David Eby has been suggesting a new policy that would implement forced treatment on drug users while simultaneously Uh, ignoring the real issues. Right. Yeah. They're going to force treatment on mental health consumers as well. That was uh, Ken Sims. Oh, you know, they, 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 he announced it, you know, they were going to create this big mental health treatment center and they had all these stakeholders involved and it was going to be so wonderful. And they announced who all the stakeholders were and not one of them was somebody with lived experience, not of one. Course. 
Right. And then there's all these stories that are going out about, you know, forced treatment and how it's important, you know, because people can't make this decision for themselves. Oh, that's, that's how they're infantilized. Is that yeah. not? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, that, and once you do that, then that person no longer has agency or voice over their own treatment over what they're given um ect has made a comeback psychosurgery is what they now call lobotomies and that's made a comeback and so you can really see how you know they they there is a threat that they will use you know forced commitments and forced treatment as social control yeah no exactly and you know evidence suggests that the real issue is prohibition right and it's that is essentially what causes harm associated with substance use rather than the acts of using and substances themselves. OK, and, so explain that for us that don't okay. understand that. Yeah. So how prohibition impacts the harms associated with substance use? Is that what you want me to? Yeah. How does okay. it make it worse? OK, so. So there's a thing called the iron law of drug war right mm-hmm. and it basically says that the more punitive the drug laws the more tainted the supply, right? Because oh. supply and demand will always exist. People right. are not going to stop using drugs because they are illegal. That is very obvious. Like history yeah, tells no that it does not stop people from using drugs. And so when they, for example, stop the supply chain from overseas of real heroin, that's going to result in more poisonous drugs, right? And we right. see that with the benzo dope. We see that with fentanyl over the last nine years. Right. And so it's just going to get more and more and more toxic to people and more and more people are going to die as long as drug policies exist within our society. Right. So you take away prohibition and and you 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 allow access to a a wide range of safe supply. Right. Then people are going to stop dying. Right. Right. That's just the way it's going to go. Like there's there's nothing that proves that this prohibition thing doesn't work. So on top of that, um, when we think about violence, right, like um, shootings, like I've witnessed since I was 13 years old, like the first shooting I ever witnessed that was related to drugs happened pretty much right in front of me. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so that's been something that I've been aware of for many, many years since I was a teenager. And it's not going to stop. Right. Like. No, it's not. The drug related violence is going to continue, right? right? People people are going to keep dying, not only from set from overdose, but from violence. You know, so those- what's needed then is what you're talking about is that you take away the prohibition, allow access to a wide range of supplies, uh, safe supplies. I- I'm assuming housing would be in there as well. And housing, yeah, 100%, right? Like, because with legalization comes conversations of, um, destigmatization and i would assume there's more there would be more human rights stuff that would come up right and and that would in turn help people have a better quality of life because those but it's not only the overdose harms that happen right it's it's like how you what you see with benzo dope like it, it, physical ailments right physical and mental health ailments and all these issues right and so people will be a little bit more stable right. mentally and physically and they'll be able to meet their needs by not having to hustle and do crime and all the things and and then they'll be able to access housing and if they want to work or if they're capable of working then you know entering the job force and right. being more quote unquote productive members of society um or even just happier and happier right (laughs) overall well-being right and and even that like i i want to talk about we don't have to get into it right now but like what goes hand in hand with that is is this poverty right like you know imagine if we had a universal basic income for all people on top of legalization that would be wonderful right Right. and overall quality of life would improve significantly right and 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 then you know i was just mentioning something about the crime rate you know crime is survival Mm -hmm. and 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 it's to get people's people do crime i committed crimes when i was a youth because i needed to get my needs met right, right. It's that i loved doing crime <laughs> it's that I, I i didn't i wasn't able to get what i needed well, right no, sometimes there is no other option unfortunately no and then and then we get back to privilege where we started is that mm-hmm. people don't necessarily understand that there isn't any other option unfortunately yeah. we need to stop here heather i'm so sorry because 
um, this is a huge conversation and I feel like we touched on a lot of things, but um, I would love to go so much deeper in so many ways with it, but we need to and stop. I have a little bit. I have like a two minute, like not even. Okay. Let's <laughs> throw it out. To do. Sure. Okay. Often comes the question of what we should be doing um, to reduce the harms associated with the drug war. Right. And um, we need to be actively challenging our own biases around substance use. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to consider the impact that drug war propaganda has on our own thinking. And if we work in harm reduction in healthcare, we must be considering policies that we follow. Right. And as community members, we must fight for real change in legislation and organize in our communities. You know, and 12,000 people have died from dr- drug poisoning epidemic. But if this were an alcohol poisoning crisis, governments wouldn't have allowed the deaths to continue. Right. Yeah. So- carry on these conversations and if anybody has any questions about you know unpacking how drug war propaganda impacts how we interact with people who use drugs i'm happy to elaborate on that and then and i'm happy to guide people in a a, if they're wishing to learn more that's great and to connect with you they can go to if i have it right tell me if i'm not yeah heather anita consulting on instagram that's right okay yeah Okay. Well, thank you so much, Heather. I appreciate this conversation and I look forward to chatting with you again one day. Awesome. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Every Sunday night, listen to What's So Funny, the show that probes the minds, the brains, the psyches, and the brains of the people who make the funny. What's So Funny? Sunday night, 11 p.m. to midnight. And that's our show. Rethreading Madness is aired on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on CFRO 100.5 FM in Vancouver and on Mondays at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time on CJUM 101.5 FM in Winnipeg. We're also found on the Mental Health Radio Network and you can download it wherever you get your podcasts to listen at your convenience. My thanks to Heather Tunold for coming to explain structural violence and how it pertains to drug use and the residents of the downtown east side. My thanks also to Edith Wallace and Sherry Ulrich for the gift of their music, but most importantly, and as always, my thanks goes out to you for joining us today. Stay safe out there. You've just listened to Rethreading Madness, where we dare to change how we think about mental health. We air live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO, 100.5 FM, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or online at coopradio.org. If you have questions or feedback about this program, or want to share your story, or have something to say to us, we want to hear from you. You can reach us by email, rethreadingmadness at coopradio.org. This is Bernadine Fox. We'll be back next week. Until then. We-